Hello, everybody. My name is Aaron Canole, and welcome back once again to another edition of the Movie Battleground. Uh, in tonight's matchup, it's exciting because even though we're already well into the season, uh, we do have a sizable roster, and so it means that even at this point, we can still have players who are coming back to make their first appearance of the season, and that is what we have tonight between Shannon and Alejandro, both competitors who kind of enter this space in a very similar situation. They're both one win away from kind of hitting that 50-50 mark. I think they both had good performances last year uh, between some exhibitions and some regular matches as well. Uh, but they just quite haven't been able to put themselves in that positive category yet. And so obviously, as they continue to kind of grow and improve, as they were both rookies last year, a win tonight would certainly do a lot for the confidence, as well as putting them up into that higher area. Uh, and so it's great to have competitors like that come in, especially as we're coming off the back of a period where we had a lot of our kind of top competitors play. It's great to have some of the mid-table players come in as well, because as we've seen, there's a lot of potential within that. I mean, of course, our current title contender, Austin Howell, was a mid-table player at one point. So certainly you can grow to that level, uh, and it'll be interesting to see how it goes tonight. So we're going to bring in our first opponent. Introducing first, with a record of one win, two defeats, is Alejandro Hernandez. Alejandro, welcome back. Uh, of course, this is technically your second appearance of the season. Uh, you appeared very sober in our drunk match, uh, but you were a part of it. Uh, how are you feeling tonight? Well, I won't say I was completely sober. I was alternatively inebriated, but that's that beside true. the point. That wasn't me cutting it for them. Right, exactly. I'm uh, very excited to be back in the battleground, though. Like, I, I love doing this, and debating movies is one of my favorite things. I, they, these questions in particular were super cool, and I did way too much prep for this one. I, I take it back. I didn't prep. I, I prepared. My teeth and ambitions are bared. You know what I'm saying? I'm ready to rock going into this season like I, I picked up a lot of tricks from a lot of my opponents going through through last year so i'm ready to show what i learned and hopefully get a little bit better than that one and two that i'm currently rocking yeah absolutely all right so we'll go ahead and sit you in the back and bring in your opponent coming in with a record of two wins three defeats he is Shannon Briggs. Shannon, welcome back as well. Obviously, this is your first appearance since uh, your entry last year in the tournament, uh, where you were unfortunately the first of what would become many victims of Mr. Austin Howell, as I said, the current number one contender. Uh, don't feel too bad. You got knocked out. So did Henry Sanchez. So everybody lost here, uh, except for him. Uh, how are you feeling, though, coming back for your first match of the season? Oh, I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, it's uh, nice and rested. Um but yeah, I'm looking forward to like yeah, learning everything that I did, my mistakes, and also my pauses that I did uh, from the last season, and hopefully we'll use that to continue to improve. And I look very forward to uh, facing Alejandro. Um, I'm biased. Sound like he sounds like he's going to be a good competitor, and that's what I'm looking for. So it'd be, I'm really looking forward to a great match tonight. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, pe people would be remiss to forget your very first match was against a championship level caliber player in Amadou Moses. And from the jump, you held yourself much better against a top player like that than other rookies did. So there's certainly something there to kind of work out. Let's just see if tonight can be the night. Uh, with that said, though, happy to have you back. I'm happy to have Alejandro. I'm going to bring you guys both in. And we're going to go ahead and jump into this. Move Battleground is a game that is a best of five rounds. It is first to three points wins the match. Each round of debate is going to be worth one point. Uh, if the, if a competitor picks up the first three points in a row, that would be a victory by knockout. And if at the end of four rounds is a two to two tie, that would activate our tiebreaker known as the blind round. Although we'll only make you worry about that if we have to go there. In terms of the regulation debate questions, you guys have had them. You've had your chance to prep. You'll get 60 seconds in an opening argument, followed by a two minute chance to expand, explain, rebut, whatever you'd like to do with that two minutes. It's all yours. If you wanted to sit there in silence for two minutes, I'd hate you. That's dead air, but you could do it. Uh, then you'll have a four minute open discussion. We'll you trade blows back and forth and try and get points in on each other, which will be followed by 60 seconds of a closing argument in which you will recap and finish up. Following that, I have three judges backstage in the form of Noah, Daniel, and Chad. They'll join us on screen, at which point, based off your arguments, they will make their deliberation for the point. With all that said, though, guys, are we ready to go or do we have any questions? Ready to go. 
Let's kick it up. All right. So we're going to start this match off by talking about not one, but two franchises that have sort of been genetically tied since way back when, uh, before there was ever a film crossover, there were comic crossovers before that they were just genetically because they're both creature feature horror movies that then evolved into more of an action thing. And, uh, we're talking about the alien and the predator franchise. And both of these franchises arguably to some sense are riding a bit of a high, obviously prey came out last year to rave reviews. Lots of people love that movie. It really felt like a revival of that franchise alien, hoping to pull off the same thing with its own Hulu feature coming in a couple of years uh, currently in production as we speak. There was also uh, purportedly a alien film involving Neil Blomkamp that was in development, not the one I believe that they're shooting right now, if memory serves me correct. I don't think he's the director of that one, although maybe I'm talking out my ass, uh, but there's a lot of hope for both of these franchises. So let's drag up the history and talk about the shit. The question is, what is the worst movie of the Alien or Predator franchise? Uh, and for what it's worth, for anyone curious, um, as of this season, these two franchises are no longer together. They are separated in the strengths category. However, this wasn't a strength. This was just a random question that I pulled and gave them uh, because it was left over from a match last year that never got played. So. They have it. Uh, so with that, they had two franchises to pick from, and I yeah, I think you could find an argument that they may have pulled the worst from each one of these franchises. Uh, maybe not the weirdest, but arguably the worst. Uh, so with that said, we're going to get into this. So behind the scenes, Shannon, because you are the higher-ranked opponent, you had the choice of which questions to go first and second on. You chose to go first on questions two and four. So Alejandro, you're going to go first on one and three. And so I'm going to go ahead and bring the timer in for you guys. Uh, and with that said, Alejandro, it'll start for you. You have one minute on the clock. Time starts when you begin speaking. When it comes to bad movies between the Alien and Predator franchises, there's a huge tip to the Alien side. From my research, it can be traced back to David Fincher's own Alien 3. The first Alien movie was revolutionary, not only as a horror movie, but also as a sci-fi movie because it... It followed Star Wars. It came out the year after Star Wars and is still remembered and beloved. That's incredibly impressive. Aliens, even though it did my least favorite thing and turned an act, a horror sequel into an action movie, it's still a heart-stopping thrill ride that most fans prefer to the original. Uh, instead of going for the hat trick, Alien 3 dropped the franchise into a hole that it really hasn't drug its, dug itself out of yet. I'm honestly shocked they decided to keep making these movies after this because this movie leaves you nothing to work with. Everything you loved about either of the first two movies is completely absent and not even replaced. Alien 3, sorry, Alien Cubed is an incoherent mess that makes me wish I was being anally incubated by a face hugger. All right, and that is time on your opening. Shannon, over to you. Okay, well, I will agree that Alien 3 in its original form was a compromised mess a studio put onto a, a first time a first time feature director. Um, it is no way the worst of these franchises. My pick had everything going for it. The returning screenwriter of the original Predator, with now an accomplished director and in the same win of his career, Shane Black. Um, it, it also had a tremendous cast of underrated actors such as Sterling K. Brown. Boyd Holbrook, Trafonti Rose, J Jacob Tremblay, and Keegan Michael Key. However, the result, The Predator, not only is an overstuffed, dumb, failed franchise starter, it feels like a relic of the 1980s screenwriting in all the bad ways. And it, like, in, considering it was the source was from Shane Black, it's even more of the like a disaster. And, and that's why I consider the worst the worst injury of the Alien Predator franchise. And I will explain more in my next turn. And that is time. So we have Alien 3 versus The Predator. Joss Whedon's ego is upset that no one brought up Alien Resurrection. But we're going to go back over to you, Alejandro. Time starts when you begin speaking. Two minutes. Resurrection sucks, but Alien 3 is worse. Side by side, the Alien and Predator franchises look equally successful, and until you think about it for more than 10 seconds. I'll admit that the first installments of each franchise have more than earned their merit. They built entire worlds with one setting, created memorable and effective protagonists, and gave us two of the most iconic movie monsters of all time. Predator 2 tends to take a backseat to Aliens because of how well-received that movie was, but Predator 2 is a good movie. 
uh, uh, to the popularity doesn't dictate value. That's a trap that franchise films like this fall into because they don't have to put in the work to get people in the theaters. Um, every, especially when it comes to horror movies. I've said it before that any schmuck with an iPhone thinks they can make a horror movie, but there's an art, an essence that needs to be captured in horror movies. Giving a big budget feature length franchise sequel to a director at the time uh, was only known for doing music videos was probably a misstep. Granted, he did do music videos for Michael Jackson, Madonna, and Aerosmith, but he didn't get another shot at directing a movie three years after this atrocity. And I would argue that he didn't have any real success as a director until 1999. And other than Sigourney Weaver and Lance Henriksen, this movie has nobody named in it that mo general movie audiences would know. You got Paul McGann, who most people probably only know as the eighth doctor, and even then, I don't think they could name him, and Pete Postlethwaite, who I only know because I'm a huge Dragonheart fan. We'll get to it. But uh, Predators, or The Predator may be a bad movie, but it may ne it will never be as bad as Alien 3. Newt is mysteriously killed off in the first 10 seconds of the movie, and believe it or not, it only goes downhill from there. Ripley is written terribly. The xenomorph is not utilized at all. The script tries and fails miserably to be edgy with shock value and bad cinematography. And worst of all, I couldn't be paid to care. Game over, man. All right, and that is time. Shannon, back over to you. Two minutes on the clock. Okay. Studio note the movie, I mean the Predator, feels like a like Shane Black just said, fuck it, I'll take all your notes and not cut a goddamn thing. And there's so much of that film, he should, it needs to be cut down because it doesn't make any sense. There's like so many plot lines intersecting with each other. And what should have been a slam dunk updated version of the original is bogged down by having to explain and elaborate every bit of lore from the original that it didn't need to. And, the, and the, all the, the, this explanation basically like demystifies all the badassness of it. Um, its big idea is what if there's a super predator who's bigger and stronger for reasons, but that just makes the overall like the sign of it looks. It just looks stupid. Um, it, it's like they're trying to do a Jurassic World and try to like make it some like a bigger enemy, and it just makes it look like lamer. Scraping feels like a relic that Chainbreak had back in the like, as the first draft in the eighties. You know what's funny? Movie Tourette's. You know your mama jokes are the are still funny in the two thousand tens, aren't they? Um. Um, you know, you um, also training Jacob Tremblay's character's autism of some sort of superpower would have been hacking 20 years ago, but to be a plot point in a film that came out in 2018 just reveals how problematic this trope is to be still used. Uh, most of the cast feel lost and are given an in at dialogue. Sterling K. Brown, who is only only positive of the film, has maybe the dumbest movie death I've ever seen. And basically, because if you sneeze, you miss it. He's built as his main non-predator antagonist throughout the film, and his death feels like an afterthought with a big whelp that happened. Everything by flawed has a captivating performance by Weaver and Charles Dance, who you did the master, who is a very good actor, is very good as well. And his character's surprise death generally shocked me in the middle, like in the middle of the film. Anthony is is a mess, but it still feels like a Fincher film. And I will conclude there. And that's time all right so we're going to go into the four minute open discussion round as always I like to remind the competitors i try not to talk with each other too much give each other a chance to breathe but you'll get a feel for it once you get into it that said the timer will start back up when the first competitor speaks i do have to defend the super predator because even though cinematically it looks ridiculous it is something that the lore follows like if you go through any of the avp comics or even the video games you have predators of various sizes with various skills it's like they look like battle toads side by side but that's they're there like you can use them hey, but they don't use them they use them in the worst way i mean yeah they might be falling from the, what's already established but you can there is a way to probably do it better if not then why do it in the first place well, at least the Predator gets used in your movie. Alien 3, the Xenomorph doesn't do anything. It walks around and sniffs stuff. It's the worst. It's a completely boring movie. Well, uh, it, I, I'm pretty sure it goes around and does, like, sneak attacks. And it also, like, the whole last third round is going around and, like, playing cat and mouse with all the prisoners. And, and very kind of really weird cost of shops, but it's kind of like a different fit way than the other aliens that time had done. 
putting the characters in one spot doesn't make them a cat and mouse trap. Like that's the whole thing about the alien franchise is that in space, nobody can hear you scream. There's also nowhere to escape too. So with that spirit in mind, they should be able to tell a story like that. But instead they, they force the other characters, the side characters who everybody would recognize if you saw them, but you couldn't name them uh, to force conflict by doing random things at random times. It, like it, it tries so hard to be shocking and horrifying. Like they put a sexual assault scene, in the movie for no reason yeah i mean i agree like it's a messy like like i said it's like yeah product is a very like yeah messy kind of like different th th like things but i feel like the predator is even more with like as far as like yeah like between like boy hobart trying to find his son and with these different mercenaries and then you have holding olivia munn like doing all these like research on this predator and like it always this introduction and stuff that just feels that bogs it down when it can be just a lean, mean predator movie, but it, it it isn't. It just it completely just loses itself with all this like trying to explain everything and trying to be witty. I, I think if you were going into the movie blind, you might feel that way. But if you watch the trailer, it's a Fast and Furious trailer with a predator that pops up sometimes. It's not trying to be a good predator movie like they're just doing this because they need to get the rights renewed alien 3 was supposed to be like the next level that's why you get david fincher and you get sigourney weaver and lance Henriksen back to reprise their roles but they can't tell a story and everybody in your cast actually has some merit nobody in my cast is known for much of anything aside from sigourney weaver lance Henriksen is even only tied to the alien franchise well, like I said, like I brought up like Charles Dance, who's like, I mean, to Game of Thrones um, um, viewers, is like, it's very well known as far as like a great British character actor. And uh, Charles S. Dutton, again, like, again, a very good character actor that has, uh, that's usually, uh, that alivens everything he's in and stuff. And I think he brings pathos to a character that could have been very one note um, and how it's introduced in the film, and how he, he, he like that character grows and willing to sacrifice himself, himself for Ripley, it means a whole lot. Um, so I, the, whereas like the Predator, I feel like the squanders all this cast, like, like again, like, and you were saying, um, that it was basically made to be the for the Predator rights. Um, that's not a good way to start a film, and especially having Shane Black on board is like a person that who made who wrote the film the original. That's not a good way to start a foundation for a good uh, franchise. They weren't going into it trying to make a good Predator movie. That's what I'm saying. They were just trying to have fun with this character. But it's a failed. <laughs> and time. All right, so we're going to go into the one minute closings. Alejandro, you are back up first. Time starts when you begin speaking. If you were to put a list together of the worst movies between the Alien and Predator franchises, the first five movies would be Alien movies. I'm cheating a little bit by putting Requiem in there, but that doesn't change the fact that there are infinitely better Predator movies, uh, which is infuriating when you consider the lore. Like, AVP comics started coming out in 1989. This was 1992. You can blame copyright or studio rivalries, whatever. Alien Cubed should not exist. But again, they don't have to try you know these characters. You want to see what happens next. Grab your popcorn, sit your ass down, shut the hell up. Well, nay, I say. I refuse to be shoveled garbage like this and expected to be happy about it. No more wild subplots that don't matter. No more making characters do random things to force conflict. And no more prequels that drone on and on talking about fucking nothing. The bottom line is the Predator may be boring or flat out bad, but it'll never be as bad as Alien 3. And at least we have Prey to fall back on. I swear to God, this movie effectively changed the tagline of the franchise to no one can hear you snore. And time. All right, Shannon, you have the final minute on the clock when ready. Um, looking in, back in hindsight, I mean, Alien 3 did not kill the franchise and definitely didn't kill Fincher's career, but the Predator um, has put a long pause on Shane Black's directorial career. As far as I know, um, he hasn't like ha doesn't have anything coming up since then, um, and it's hard to believe that this was after Black's film, The Nice Guys, which I think is one of the best films of the last decade. Um, Fisher, Fisher was able to move on after the end three, but Black has fallen down, and the Predator franchise had to start from scratch, literally with Prey. Like it had to go back um, a few hundred years to to uh, get a new fresh start. 
Also, um, the pair was supposed to be co writer Fred Decker's heroic return after being absent in film for decades. He directed the Monster Squad and Night of Creeps. Um, but the Predator only proved that Decker, like most of the things in the Predator, should have stayed in the 80s. And that is the end of my argument. All right, that is time. All right, guys, great first opening round there. I'm going to go ahead and put you guys in the back and bring our judges on screen here uh, for their deliberation. Uh, so just a couple of small quick things to uh, fact check. Uh, first off, when talking about the director's careers, uh, I think it is very obviously worth stating that Alien 3 did not kill Fincher's career. Uh, within three years, he was able to move on to seven and since then has had a pretty successful career. Uh, at the moment, as far as I could find, Chain Black does not have anything in development. At one point, he did have a sequel to his Alien film in development, although since that went downward, uh, it does not seem like anything else has entered the picture for him uh in terms of and this is the last thing that i'm just waiting on to load the alien and predator franchises uh now obviously personal opinion is one thing but using the metric that we do use of rotten tomatoes because it's the quickest way of finding a consensus when fact checking uh there are actually two uh alien there are two predator films that are worse reviewed than the worst alien film predator 2 is actually the lowest rated of any of the franchise films coming in at a 32 percent approval rating on rotten tomatoes uh, and then The Predator has a 33% on Rotten Tomatoes. For what it's worth, my numbers are taking out AVP and AVP Requiem because they're crossed over if we're talking about just the base franchises. Uh, the Predator has a 33% approval. Predator 2 is a 32% approval. Then Alien 3, which is the lowest rated of the Alien franchise at 48%. Uh, Alien Resurrection, which a lot of people will often cite because of its weirdness as the worst film, is actually better reviewed at a 54%. Um, so with that said, we're going to go to Noah first. Based on the arguments, who gets your vote and what was the main selling point in that argument? Shannon's going to get my point on this one. I feel like he was able to really go against almost every point Alejandro had against his film um, or against his argument, really. And he was just able to – one point that really stuck with me is that he said, kind of ruin the mysticism of Predator and and all that kind of stuff because it was doing the stupid thing by explaining everything and, and exposition and all that. So I'm going to get to Shannon. Okay. Daniel, we'll go down to you. First off, I always like to say welcome when it's somebody's first time in the show. So based off the arguments you heard, who gets your vote and what was the main selling point of their argument? Yeah, yeah. thanks for having me, first of all. And I... I think I also have to give the point to Shannon because I I just throughout his arguments he made a lot of points about why the movie he was talking about was terrible and those resonated a lot to me and like they were there were consistent arguments and I they like each one told me why I shouldn't go watch that movie so I I I think the points for him. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and sit the judges in the back and bring in the competitors as we'll move on to question number two. Uh, I'm sorry I put you guys through those films. I'll reward you. We'll move on from bad horror to good horror. Uh, George Romero, George A. Romero to his friends, uh, is a legendary director of the horror industry. Single-handedly, you could argue he created the modern zombie genre with his films. Uh, all the way directing into the 2000s up until his passing, I believe. He was still directing. Uh, he, he's passed away, right? I didn't just get that wrong. No, he, he did. Yeah, he's passed away. Cool. Okay, cool. That would have been real bad if I had just said he died and then he didn't. I would have been like that guy that, uh, oh, fuck, who was it? Somebody just said someone died. Oh, Travolta. I think it was Travolta. Somebody's like Travolta died or something and it wasn't true. Uh, anyways, I... Why do I do the things I do sometimes? The question is, what is the best film directed by George Romero? That is the question. Uh, a lot of great options here, both within that famed franchise and without that famed franchise, quite frankly. He's got some great films in there. Let's see what these guys came up with. Uh, Shannon, we're going to go to you first as I throw back up the timer. It'll start when you begin speaking. Um, I don't think it's a bold statement to say that George Romero was an iconic director in the horror um, 
his greatest legacy being laying the fundamentals of the zombie subgenre that was are still being used to this day. Um, while I say Night of the Living Dead was a landmark film in the genre, no question, his next foray into zombies, Dawn of the Dead, fully epitomized the style and the satire that Romero would use for the rest of his filmography. Uh, Dawn of the Dead not only branches out the lore and the apocalyptic world set up in, the, in Night of the Living Dead, but with pioneering practical effects, uh, gore effects by Tom Savini, Dawn of the Dead revolutionized horror films and still is in a fundamental film that other filmmakers have referenced and homage to this very day. That is why uh, Dawn of the Dead was the, I believe Dawn of the Dead is, was the best film directed by George Romero, and I will explain more in the next round. All right. So I'll take that as the end of Shannon's opening. Uh, because of a timer blunder on my end, he got a few extra seconds in there, Alejandro. So I'll take a few seconds before I start the timer just to keep it equal here. So your time will start once you begin speaking. You know what's more impressive than creating an iconic movie monster? Building a template for one. George A. Romero gave us an incredible gift with the creation of the modern day movie Zombie. So when you ask me about his best movie, how could you go with anything else other than The Night of the Living Dead? The, the OG, the original, you might say. It's so compelling from the opening scene in the graveyard to the shock ending that audiences still debate about to this day. Is it racist? A little bit. Uh, the subplot with the Coopers trying to save themselves while their daughter slowly becomes this mindless thing has become a staple in horror movies scripted shot sung ever since see the evil dead musical for reference which wouldn't even exist without this movie if you google first movie zombies the first thing you see is night of the living dead it's a classic a cornerstone in horror movie history and for good reason all right so i'll take that as the end of the opening there uh, i think we're really really underrating the i want to say 2007 modern classic diary of the dead uh, where george romero decided to take the dying genre of zombie films and mash it with the dying genre of found footage films uh listen they can't all stay great forever at least he didn't go out like eastwood screaming at chairs uh shannon we're gonna go back over to you time starts when you begin speaking in Dawn of the Dead, Romero had his most concise satirical topic directed at capitalism. And horror films had been satiric to a point before Dawn, but had but Dawn just had sharp social commentary equating mindless zombies in, in a mole to customers mindlessly shuffling around before the apocalypse and having survivors still placing value on physical cash despite its worthlessness. While Knight had a great performance by Dwayne Jones, it also had a more an immature cast around him that that kind of that kind of drags that film's uh, quality a little bit of that the acting quality down. But while Don has a much stronger cast led by the underrated Ken Forey and a much stronger um, actress um, uh, leading actress in Gail Roth, the uh, film also applied the same cynicism as Night, but also added tongue-in-cheek humor that makes it unique for its time. Tom Safin's gore effects helped to fully realize the zombies. It was inspiring to horror film um, in uh, films of the 70s, 80s, and 90s um, throughout. Um, while um, I consider Night is a classic, it's very noticeable how much it lags around for a good portion of its runtime, and it's very repetitive. Whereas Dawn, um, it makes full use of a like empty mold they had to use. They, they had to film at certain hours throughout the time. And they really made a use of that, and it makes the and that, that movie does not drag. Uh, we see all the characters in Don and Fob, and how they are introduced in the beginning to the film for arcs by, by the end. And Don fully encapsulates Romero as a filmmaker more than Knight, but shows more of his talent, but also a lot of his inexperience. And I feel like to say at night uh, is Romero's best movie would be a disservice to just how much filmmaking and writing evolves between Knight and Don. And I will see my argument. I'll see my time oh. till the next time. Sorry. No, you're good. All right. Uh, what I want to hear is two more minutes about the fact that there's a fucking Evil Dead musical. That is not something I thought I would learn tonight. But instead, you can take the two minutes to talk about Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead. It starts when you begin speaking. You know what the punchline is? It's really good. 
When I say template, I mean in the same way Nosferatu gave us movie vampires, George Romero changed the word ghoul to zombie with Night of the Living Dead. Reanimation wasn't exactly a new idea, but it had never been done in a horde. I, that's where Romero changed the game entirely without even realizing. He originally called them ghouls, which are actually a pre-Islamic concept of creatures that are that appear human but aren't. So your vampires, your doppelgangers, and of course, what we've all come to call zombies. Dawn of the Dead may have been the first to implement the word zombie, but uh, Night of the Living Dead birthed the concept. Uh, everybody attributes that cr their creation to Night of the Living Dead. Like I said, the opening scene in the cemetery with Johnny and Barbara uh, is totally iconic. They get attacked by some unassuming bystander who kills Johnny. It's been like a minute and a half. We hit the ground running and we don't stop until the dawn. Pun absolutely intended. We meet Ben, who's an incredibly efficient protagonist. The dude has no waste of emotion. Tom, Harry, and Helen emerge from the cellar to give us our cattle characters, the characters who only exist to die. But again, they gave us the zombie subplot of a character slowly turning without the knowledge of the rest of the cast. And it's done infinitely better here because they don't know what's about to happen. They, they're not trying to keep it a secret. They're not rolling their sleeves down or whatever. They simply don't know. And in horror, the fear is in the not knowing. By the time we get to the end of the movie, we're as exhausted as everybody on screen who just fought off this mass of dead flesh because it's that visceral. Romero decides to give us one last shock and awe right at the end, though, by shooting Ben in the head, a guy that you root for from the minute he comes on screen. It's a magnificent story with outstanding performances, and movie fans will still be talking about it long after I rise again from the cold, cold ground. And time. All right, we're going to go into the four-minute open discussion. The timer starts back when the first competitor speaks. Um, I will not doubt that Night Live and Dead is a great, I mean, a classic for a reason, but people remembered the first first few minutes of Night of Living Dead and the last minutes of Night of Living Dead. But people forget, in between that, there's a lot of boring up the walls, a lot of, like, rest time, a lot of, like, Ben trying to, like, completely, like, try to, like, basically... He's trying to keep everybody in line. For sure. And it's, so, I mean, it's... It's, it's, it's called it's, character it's, dynamic. It works beautifully. Um, these characters are real people uh, dawn of the dead because it's so satirical their car their characters are almost cartoonish like i don't i don't understand like these are not real people that i'm aware of anyway well i think i mean they feel pretty real me as far as like once they like are hold up in the mold like first they're like living it up and real happy but then they realize that we are like but being even when you're anywhere where we think you have everything you don't you don't have like the when you're like the companionship or like the, the like when a human race is completely disappeared and it's just you, you realize how lonely you are. And I think that Don Dead really conveys that loneliness with that this is small group survivors that basically it just have themselves and nobody else for like months and they just realize how like worthless everything that they've they're there's they've they've tried to stay, survive in is. I disagree. I think if you're characters in a zombie movie are having fun you immediately lose the bite uh, again pun absolutely intended um though it's supposed to be a horror movie sequel like why would you why would you try to make it a comedy like i guess it does happen with movie monsters generally like i know of a cartoon that's like power rangers but they turn into monsters instead of rangers it's completely surreal when you consider like the folklore that these things came from and the word zombie actually does exist in Haitian, French, and Creole. Like, uh, that's where they got the term zombie for Night of the Living Dead. A French magazine called Cahiers du Cinéma called them zombies when reviewing the movie. Not 10 years later when Dawn of the Dead came out. Again, I mean, I feel like you were saying how not unrealistic Dawn is. I feel like it is um, with the comedy. I feel like... In real life, if you were like in that dire situation, yet you, you would like your it's a gut instinct to feel like you want to add some sort of levity in this situation, whatever. And I feel like he George Romero with the characters in there, he shows that like yeah, like there is like some like some like some saniness or whatever. But it's kind of like yeah, giving kind of some sort of levity with all this the, the darkness or whatever. That especially with the first one where there was like yeah, no 
like darkness. It's like his way of like kind of showing that it's weird, like have the weird saniness even in this like hellish landscape of the apocalypse. And yeah, I'm, I'm not necessarily like saying that it was like Dawn of Dead was the be all of, of the zombie. I feel like more like the gore that that Tom C's gore is like definitely people homage with different kinds of horror movies. I suppose the the effects get better, but you still have to be horrifying if you're going to be a horror movie sequel. Like you feel the desperation in Night of the Living Dead because we are stuck in this room the whole time. We can't get out. That's the whole thing. We feel their desperation and trying to board up the windows and trying to work together in the frustration of Harry not helping out because he's trying to keep his family safe and nobody else. Like it's all interesting and always uh, compelling to watch. I really enjoy this movie. I feel like in Don Dan, did you remember from Real Life the Fish? And like, we really want to see what happens when a zombie grabs hold of a human being and just goes full brutal on it. We like the visceral gore and stuff like that. We've always, like, he knew the audience had, was always the one that, that he was able to give on Night of the Dead. So he really put that in Don to show it. And time. All right. So we're going to go into the one minute or closings. Shannon, you're back up first. Time starts when you begin speaking. Okay, uh, Romeo could have easily rest on his laurels after Night of the uh, Living Dead because, again, yeah, yeah, it laid a framework for this, the framework for the zombie movie uh, um, at that time. It was like revolutionary. But the thing is, he didn't. He didn't, and then he showed that with Don, his growth as a director, his growth as a screenwriter. And I said, watch any movie in zombie movie in the last three years and tell me that Dawn of the Dead hasn't had an influence on it. Well, night, like I said, like, has laid the groundwork for the zombie genre. The Dawn of the Dead, I feel, is the structure that the zombie genre has used to survive and to continue to thrive with, throughout the decades. Dawn is the encapsulation of Romero as a, um, a filmmaker and his vision, and that is why it is his best film as a director. And I will see the rest of my argument. Okay, so we'll go over to you, Alejandro. You have one minute left on the clock. You can start once it turns over. If you need a second, I will give it to you. Dawn of the Dead is a fun movie, but it had the unfortunate timing of coming out in 1978, getting buried under a bunch of other horror movies like Damien the Omen sequel, Jaws 2, two of my favorite horror movies in Invasion of the Body Snatchers and Anthony uh, Hopkins' best performance in a movie ever with magic. And let's not forget the giant masked elephant in the room that is John Carpenter's the first installment of the Halloween franchise. This, that doesn't mean that it's a bad movie. Just Dawn of the Dead may have been a stepping stone for zombie movies, but Night of the Living Dead created the concept. Uh, it set the bar so high that Ramiro struggled to reach it himself after, the, after this. There's no 30-minute buildup introducing characters that you can either choose to like or hate. Uh, this is just something that happens to these people. And you're hooked from the first time you hear, they're coming to get you, Barbara. It's my favorite zombie movie of all time. And without it, we don't have great zombie movies that we have to get. And that is time. All right. Competitors, another good round. I'm going to go ahead and put you guys in the back, and I'm going to bring our judges in here for the deliberation. Uh, these guys clearly know their stuff. Not a lot to really clean up there in terms of facts. So, Daniel, I'm going to go to you first. Who gets your vote, and what was the main selling point of the argument? I hmm. I, I think i got to give this one to Alejandro by about a hair. I, I do really like... Uh, the arguments he was making about like the invention of the concept of the zombie film and um, the I I do like the exposure to the characters and uh, even though it is slower it uh, it is it's it's more fun to like get to know the characters and then uh, yeah that, that about sold it for me all right, so the first vote goes to Alejandro this time around. Chad, down to you. Who gets your vote, and what was the main selling point? Yeah, um, both competitors definitely knew their stuff, um, but I'm, I'm also going with Alejandro here um, just because, you know, he, he he did pick the classic. I mean, they're both classics, but, you know, I think he really sold his 
um, talking about like, you know, right at the very beginning, they get attacked and it doesn't stop from there. He sold it as, you know, George Romero made uh, changed what we think about zombies, didn't even mean to do it, and then couldn't really even top the, his first entry later on himself. Um, and then he talked about the characters, how it is. It also, you know, Don, like Dawn established some tropes, but Knight, Knight established a lot of tropes as well, like the um, the one character who's a zombie and they don't even know it until it's too late and um, stuff like that. And uh, yeah, and then you just his like knocks against Dawn was like talking about like, you know, uh, cartoonish characters and how uh, Dawn got buried by like a lot of other films like Halloween and stuff like that. So he just had a lot of... Uh, good counters as well. Okay. So with that, Alejandro is going to get the point. Judges, thank you guys. I'm going to go ahead and put you in the back as we will go ahead and jump into question number three. And uh, as always before, there's a look of confusion on people's face at the time of upload, not at the time of recording. This upcoming weekend, we are going to be seeing Nicolas Cage return gloriously to theaters in Renfield, a movie in which he co-stars with Nicholas Holt as the infamous Dracula, but not just any Dracula, the classic Nosferatu version of Dracula, and Cage will get to return to blockbuster cinema in all his caginess. And that is certainly a way to describe it. Uh, Nicolas Cage is an actor, whether he's in good movies, shit movies, or whatever we're going to call National Treasure, he brings his own element and vibe to the film and i think that putting him in specific roles can be enough to change the vibe of the film so the question i gave these two gentlemen is if you could recast any role in film history with nicholas cage in place of the original actor of course which role would it be and these guys have pulled out probably the last two roles that i honestly would have thought of and in that way, it is true to Nicolas Cage. So I'm looking forward to this argument. With that said, Alejandro, you were up first this time around. So I will give you the timer, and it will start when you begin speaking. Yeah, this question was particularly difficult. Not only because there are infinite characters that we could choose from with no restrictions on genre, decade, or anything like that. There's also roles that people have been talking about Nick Cage missing out on for years, like Superman or Aragorn. Nicolas Cage is really one of those guys who can do everything, and he does, from action to comedy to voiceover to stunt work. The dude has an extensive and diverse resume. But guess what I like? Horror movies. So I thought of a film that should have been good but wasn't. I want to replace Vince Vaughn as Norman Bates in Psycho 1998 with Nicolas Cage. He sort of took like a duck to water when it came to horror movies in more recent years. So what would have happened if he had tried to follow Anthony Perkins' masterful performance? Norman Bates is not an over-the-top character. He, his reserve and awkward demeanor make him uh, sentimental almost and compelling, and I think Nick Cage would have given his all to it. Understand that I think Vince Vaughn is a great choice for that role, but I think Nicolas Cage just makes it that much better. And time. All right, Shannon, back over to you. Who are you recasting with Nicolas Cage? Well, I will agree with uh, Alejandro that this was a very difficult question and I had to rack my brain. But why I ended up deciding was I was saying, what is an objectively bad actor who I can replace with Nicolas Cage? And not only is it a certified upgrade for the role in the film, but the actor he is replacing theoretically never headlined a movie ever again. So I, um, Hulk Hogan is an iconic wrestler, a trash human being. And without a doubt, a terrible actor. He is such a bad actor that he played a professional wrestler in his first on role, and it sucked. So if I could recast any role uh, in film history with Nicolas Cage, I would have him as Rip Thomas in No Holds Barred. Trust me, the more you think about it, the more Nicolas Cage would be the perfect recast as a professional wrestler. And I will explain more in the next round. Absolutely. Uh, somehow Nicolas Cage feels versatile enough to play whatever the hell Vince Vaughn is doing in that movie and whatever the hell Hulk Hogan is doing in that movie. Uh, so, boys, I think you found the spirit of the question. Alejandro, back over to you. You have two minutes. Time starts when you begin speaking. I'm really glad that you said they were different because I really don't understand how Nicolas Cage is at all synonymous with Hulk Hogan. It completely changes the tone of the film if you have that guy acting like Hulk Hogan acts. Like, No Holds Barred was 1989. Nicolas Cage was just getting traction in his career. 
is the objective to laugh at him. I think he would have played, like, I think he would have sold the shit out of that role, like played it completely straight face. I think it would have been entirely detrimental to how young his career was. Whereas with Psycho, Nicolas Cage had already done The Rock, Con Air, and Face Off leading up to 1998. Topping that off with a character performance under one of the biggest names in horror, I feel would have skyrocketed his popularity, especially following up with 8mm and Gone in 60 Seconds. Are you kidding me? Like I said, Cage eventually became a must-see actor when it came to horror movies after let's let's call it cult success with the wicker man then he did uh mom and dad color out of space uh and like aaron said he's going to be playing dracula and renfield which will probably be out by the time this is shown but that's not important um if nothing else seeing that guy in that role would have been a treat all the way around plus i don't think gus van sant is that good a director but also vince Vaughn was very young when he did the role so he wouldn't have had the know-how or the balls even to say hey let's try this whereas nicholas cage after coming off of working with sean connery john cusack and john travolta would definitely have the xp to argue that battle i'm having a really hard time imagining nicholas cage in a wrestling ring especially since he turned down the role of randy the ram in the wrestler because he said he couldn't pull it off for a guy as ambitious and versatile as Nicolas Cage to say that it proves that he know he doesn't know the first thing about wrestling. He wouldn't even know where to go. He knows his limits and I respect that. All right. That is time. Shannon, back over to you. Two minutes. Okay, first and foremost, Snow House Bar is a very bad movie, but having Nicolas Cage in it would make it an entertaining bad, not an em embarrassing bad like with Hulk Hogan. Nicolas Cage is another in another life could have been a professional wrestler. He has so much charisma and lunatic energy that would match with the cocaine fueled frenzy of 80s professional wrestling. You say that he would turn down the, the, the he's the, like later on life. That's later. We're talking about Nicolas Cage in the late '80s, and like I said, this could be a, like this, like this. Me, Roland Nicholas Rive could have been a whole bull part for him to chew on. While Hogan is completely unemotive in the dramatic scenes of No Hope's Bar, Cage would literally act the fuck out of them. He also would be more of an underdog against Ty Lister's Seuss character, heavy character, and their final battle would be more intense and more like you would more believe that he would be the underdog in that fight. Cage would be able to match the uh, character actor Kurt Fuller, who's understood the assignment of that movie, unhinged performance as the main antagonist. The thing with the Cycle remake is that no matter who stars in it, it still wouldn't elevate it from being a bad film inside a fascinating experiment. Vince Vaughn has proven he is an underrated dramatic hour, actor, and the weirdness he adds as Norman Bates at least differentiates his performance from the original Anthony Perkins. Um, I feel like it would be more of a lateral move recasting Cage because of his performance. Like Fonz would wouldn't be the fatal flaw of the cycle remake. Um, however, No Holds Bar would benefit so much more with Cage's performance. I would believe Cage would play a person who's crazy enough to. Um, Make a man shit his pants out of fear. Have you seen him in Vampire's Kiss? That performance alone would get a shit out of my pants. And time. All right, we're going to go into the four-minute open discussion. Uh, bonus points goes to whoever can pull off the best cage impression in the next four minutes. But for the real point, the debate starts when the first person speaks. I have to say, like, Expecting Nicolas Cage to be over the top kind of takes away from the over the topness of the performance. Like, like I was saying, Norman Bates is not an over the top character. He could have moments of being over the top in 1998 when they were reshooting the movie. But again, production wise, Gus Van Sant is not the best director. They were trying to do a shot for shot remake and having Vince Vaughn act like Anthony Perkins. Like, Anthony Perkins has such a hold of that character. Like, even in the later Psycho movies, like 3 and 4, they're great movies because that guy knows that character. Nicolas Cage, I think, could bring that to Norman Bates, his own flavor, without having to do all this over-the-top nonsense. Well, that's, uh, we can say this, we, we have to also include that the Psycho remake had um, um, performances by Anne Heche and Julianne Moore and William Macy. And again, I don't... 
Then yeah. again, they they all give. I mean, good performance. I feel like exactly. it's not the problem. I feel like the problem is like Gus Van Sant. I feel like replacing um Fawn with um with Cage would be like replacing the window of a shitty beat up car without any tires. It's like you're doing something, but you're not fixing the main or underlying problem of that film. Again, so Nicholas Cage would have had the know how to be like, hey, this isn't going to work. I want to try something else because actors of that caliber, especially at that time could pull that off. Hulk Hogan, there's something of a charm that he brings to Rip in No Holds Barred. Like, that movie is ridiculous. It's so stupid, but it it keeps the pace. Like, the tone it sets at the beginning of the movie carries through. Like, it, it doesn't try to be anything other than a shit show. Hulk Hogan has a charm, but it's only good for a few minutes. That's why he's a wrestler. Like, he can pull off a few minute promos or wrestle maybe, I mean, 10 or 15 minute matches, but have required him to do anything longer than like 20 minutes for like anything like that shows his limitations and how like how weak of a fit he was to be a feature film actor. Whereas I feel like Nicolas Cage from the get go showed that he could be able to handle any kind of film, that especially in the age when he's a young and hungry actor, that he would again see this, it's admittedly like. I mean, bad script and stuff like that, and be able to like work his own way. I'm not saying he's going to have him completely impersonate Hulk Hogan. No, I believe that Nicholas Cage could come up with his own idea of like how this a professional wrestler could go. He could go by with so many other like ideas as far as like how to interpret professional wrestling. It would be super interesting to see how his mind works with that. But he wouldn't have any frame of reference. Like the entire reason he turned down the wrestler was because. He's not a wrestling fan. He doesn't know how to act like a wrestler or what even to do. Like, yes, you can get him a coach. He would try his damnedest. The movie's still going to suck. Whereas if you switch Vince Vaughn with Nicolas Cage and Psycho as the lead character, that's going to be a compelling story. Like, that's going to be a performance of a lifetime. That movie skyrockets with the star-studded cast. Like you said, like, all of these people are very good actors. The movie just doesn't do them any favors. Yeah, I mean, again, I and I just feel like is the cycle room is one of them cases where it just again it's not a like again the actor problem is I mean actor isn't the, the, the actors are not the problem it's, again it's like something you have to rework from the ground up with that so again I I feel like just add, I mean even adding Nicolas Cage to it would would again would not improve would again would not change the outcome of that film no matter what I would feel like well, Nicolas Cage would be. At the end, would be frustrated. He probably would end up leaving that film uh, with Clash Much with Jeff like fans. a great wrestler can perform a great match with a broomstick. A good actor can save a bad script. Nicolas Cage would have definitely brought a lot more flavor to the Psycho movie. He probably would have even saved that movie from the. I don't remember what it is like forty percent on Rotten Tomatoes. And time. All right, so we're gonna go into the one minute closing. Alejandro, you are back up first. Tom starts when you begin speaking. Nicolas Cage has nothing to gain and everything to lose if he takes over for Hulk Hogan. Would it be funny? Maybe, but then he just becomes a joke. The clown gimmick is an incredibly difficult to shed for actors. Like Speaking from personal experience, but also you look at guys like Jim Carrey, Steve Carell, Adam Sandler, guys that started off as joke actors, but audiences wouldn't take them seriously unless they were slapping sticks. But each one of these guys has the ability to be a strong, serious actor. That's the trap, right? Like, sure, Nicolas Cage is known for being over the top, but some of the greatest actors are Michael Shannon, Jack Nicholson. You expect these guys to be outrageous, but you also expect them to tell the story. Like, having him be outrageous just to be funny because it's outrageous works about as well as fighting fire with fire he deserves better and psycho even the 1998 cut is better than no holds barred specifically about 30 percent better as is and time all right shannon <clears throat> back over to you final minute on the clock when ready Again, the recasting Cage as Norman Bates in the Cycle remake would not fix the execution of the remake on a technical level. Um, I believe that having Cage and Noah's Bar would make the other cast and director step up and make it into a cult classic. It would be a m m more better regarded film than what it was. And I don't, and I said, I think Cage could be able to utilize what he could do and not become his character. I, again, I think he is a very careful actor 
that knows that he can understand the assignment when he can, when he's able to work with. And I feel like if it, um, it doing that would prevent from like Hulk Hogan continuing to have like his it would prevent the Messer nannies and the suburban commandos and the center with muscles from ever happening as well. I feel like the world would be much better without those, um, that, that cinematic legacy going on. And I feel like, like, again, having him as that would have probably, again, would have opened his eyes with action and more much earlier. So, I mean, it's a win win. And time. All right, guys, another good round there. I'm going to go ahead and sit you in the back and bring the judges in for the deliberation here. Uh, so in terms of fact checking, it's very, very brief. Uh, the first thing is, uh, when talking about the, uh, specifically the point that was often used was it was the, uh, the actors were the least of the issue with the psycho remake and specifically then the screenplay was brought up by the opposing competitor. Uh, funny enough, the screenplay is actually the same one from the original. And I mean, it's quite literally the same one from the original. Joseph Stefano has credit on both films. He is the sole writer of both of them. They literally just reuse the exact same screenplay. Uh, so arguably, there is a version of this film that improved on that screenplay. It's called Psycho. It was released in 1960. It was directed by Alfred Hitchcock. But I guess that was the experiment, wasn't it? Uh, in terms of the critical reception, because that was brought up, Psycho had the Psycho remake has a 40% approval rating with an average score of 5.3 out of 10, a 28% audience approval rating with an average score of 2.5 out of 5. Uh, meanwhile, No Holds Barred has a lower critical score with a 10% approval rating and an average of 3 out of 10, with a 34% audience approval rating and a 2.8 out of 5. So while Psycho is the better critic film, audiences ever so slightly actually preferred No Holds Barred. I've never put myself through either of these films because I've seen The Good Psycho and I never heard of No Holds Barred before this. So, Chad, I'm going to go up to you. Who gets your vote? Is Nick Cage being a psycho or a wrestler? Well, I mean, this one was actually a very, very fun question, and I really dug both um, choices, both arguments. Um, this is a very even uh, round for me, as pretty much all three rounds have been pretty even, I think. Um but ultimately, I think I'm going to give it to Alejandro. Um, Shannon did have me for a, quite a while, actually, selling me on this the wrestler take for Nick Cage. But then, you know, Alejandro was talking about how, you know, uh, No Holds Barred is, is like a really, really bad movie, you know, even, even still um, with Psycho being like just that much better, apparently, like the remake. Um, so I'm sitting there wondering, like, how much could... Like he he painted that that image in my head. How much could Nick Cage actually elevate that wrestling movie? All right, Noah, down to you. Who gets your vote and who got the uh, what was the main selling point? As concise as you can get it for me. Um, there, there's a lot of different reasons why I'm choosing Alejandro, but to, just to keep it concise and um, to be as quiet as I can because people in my house are trying to sleep. Um, one of the points that I really agreed with was Nick Cage himself said that he, or well, he he turned down um, the role for the wrestler because he feel like he couldn't do it or he, like he wasn't prepared for it or whatever. Um, so I, I'm giving my point to Alejandro. Okay. All right. Well, with that, Alejandro will take the next point. Guys, thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and sit you in the back, and we will go ahead and jump into the fourth question of this matchup. Uh, and we are going to be moving from this fantasy land of a question into real fantasy lands. The question is, what is the best leading character in a fantasy film? Uh, and I should say, uh, as a preface to the question, uh, I took lead in a very light sense as long as they were clearly a major central character of the film that was suggested they are a leading character in that sense i don't literally need you to be the number one person but you have to be the lead because fantasy films are often ensembles of course we just had the release of dungeons and dragons which in and of itself was an ensemble fantasy film which i'm hoping because at the time of recording we're one day away from its release i hope it made money because apparently it's excellent, uh, but it, it's probably not going to. Uh, with that said, though, we're going to jump into this. Uh, Shannon, you are back up first, so the timer will start for you once you begin speaking. Well, I said so this is the last round that that was the one question was very hard, but this I, one I think was by far one of the hardest questions I've ever had on movie battleground. 
but the, again, I ask myself what constitutes as a leading character, and I decide it's a character that not only holds the film together, but whose arc and performance is memorable. And with that in mind, my only choice can be Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, as played by the great Ian McKellen. While some might argue, like I said, that The Fellowship Ring is more of an ensemble, um, if you look closely, Gandalf is the character that holds that film together and is instrumental in its success. Gandalf proves that a lead character does not have to be the main character of the story or film. And I will explain more in the next round. All right. So Gandalf is up first. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move over to Alejandro. You have one minute on the clock when ready. Well, it wouldn't be one of my matches unless I argued something sort of obscure. Uh, it was actually kind of funny. I asked for Middle Earth as a strength, and Aaron told me we had consolidated all of the magical fantasy into one genre, and that actually gives me a chance to talk about movies and characters that I otherwise wouldn't have the chance to talk about. Uh, one of my favorite characters of all time, from one of my all-time favorite movies, is uh, Sir Bowen, my pick for best lead character from Dragonheart, 1996. Uh, this, you. Uh, Fantasy lead characters are often generic. You have young, know-nothing nobodies from who gives a fuck Arkansas trying to reach their full potential by facing trials along a journey that they did not choose. Bowen is none of those things. He's already maxed out when we first meet him. He's a very respected member of the uh, royal court and a sword fighter who's so good that he gets tasked but to train the son of the king. Uh, his trials come from his fall from grace after he sees the monster he helped create in Ainan's tyranny. It's a phenomenal performance. And time. All right. So it is Ian McKellen versus Dennis Quaid. Uh, we are going to go back over to you, Shannon. Time starts when you begin speaking. I will say that Gandalf is the character who immediately helps Frodo with any other characters to find a way to destroy the Ring of Sauron. He is perhaps the wisest um, wizard ever put on film. And McKellen's performance is able to convey the wisdom, loyalty, and frankly, badassness throughout the film. He is instrumental in the chase scene in the minds of Mora uh, towards the last third of the film. That is, by, I think, by far the, the most of the, the memorable part of that uh, the movie with some of those memorable moments. Um, his confrontation with the Balrog includes the delivery of one of the greatest film lines in the last 25 years. Say it with me. You shall not pass. And it pays off with his sacrifice to protect his friends. His supposed death leaves a huge presence in, in throughout the ending of that film. Um, uh, Sir Bowen and Dragonheart, um, no offense to Alejandro, but I think that character is frankly kind of an idiot. Uh, idiot. The film makes it pretty clear early on that the prince he's mentoring is a psychopath, that Primus has evil highlighted above him. However, Bowen spends 12 count him 12 years killing dragons because he believed there was good in that kid to begin with and you know the kicker the film never gives that character any humanity even when he's a grown-up david Lewis. um so bone looks even more like looks even more like an idiot for killing dragons and not like seeing what's right in front of him um there's nothing about Bowen that makes him stand out from nice like author and you and him, Alejandro saying about him being already a skilled um, swordsman or whatever. It kind of makes him a little bit boring if you ask me. Uh, having a character that's already like built up and has like no like real faults, um, and I feel like the film is more focused on Draco and Sean Connery's performance um, in that film more than Dennis Quaid's. And time. All right, Alejandro, back over to you. Firstly, and I hate that I have to say this, but I do have to argue, Gandalf is not a lead. He's a very prominent character in these movies, sure, but all of the characters are. Like, Galadriel gets an arc. That doesn't make her a lead. Gandalf, to me, is the mentor to the Rangers. He's someone that the main characters look up to and helps guide them, but the story is not about him. Dragonheart is absolutely about Bowen. He has such a strong sense of right and wrong because he's a knight. Like, you hear the words echo into eternity. A knight is sworn to valor. His word speaks only truth. His blade defends the helpless. His might upholds the weak. Uh, he 
they're mere words until he says them because they mean something to them. Like characters will quote it at him throughout the entire movie, including uh, Brother Gilbert and Draco. But it's not until the end of the movie that we get to hear what they actually mean. His entire world crumbles from what he sees as his failure uh, to instill those beliefs into his prodigy. Like Dennis Quaid brings humility to the character that's completely vulnerable. The moral of Bowen's story is it's possible to do everything right and still fail, but you only truly fail when you give up. Like we get to experience Bowen giving up and rising again, not with a newfound purpose, but with the strength to do what he knows must be done. He spends the entire movie blaming a creature that he projects blame on, but in the end, he sets aside his prejudice and accepts his own inability to see the what Einan was. Like He owns his responsibility, and that makes him the best lead character in any magical creature film. It's easy to root for an underdog. Like Even the smallest triumph seems big. Like Seeing a character claw their way out of their own spiraling darkness through perseverance and integrity. That's something else entirely. Bowen kicks ass. And we will end on ass. All right, that's going to be Alejandro's two minutes. We're going to go into the four-minute open discussion. The timer starts back up when the first competitor speaks. I feel like that the, you were bringing about Bowen's like arc and stuff. I feel like the problem with it, not a problem with it, the film is that it's at a little over an hour and about forty minutes. It feels like it really kind of rushes that arc. Whereas um, in Lord of Rings, the, the, Peter Jackson allows the um, all the characters that gives a three hour, the, the, like three hours to he spans on all the characters and gives them full, I mean, again, gives them all something to do a long way. It's including great Gandalf, who, again, starts out beginning one way, but then and at the end, I mean, again, proves how, I mean, you, that character, how, like, how loyal and how, like, how much things have changed at the end of that film. I feel it's kind of stretching to say Peter Jackson gave him that because the story's already written. For him, like Peter Jackson brought it to life, but he didn't originate it. And Gandalf, originally, he's he's not super helpful. Like even Saruman in Fellowship of the Ring tells him, "Man, you smoke too much weed. How did you not know that this ring was in the Shire the whole time? Like you've been there every other week buying weed. What the hell?" But and, and like that's how he's written in the book. Like even what you were talking about in the Mines of Moria. It, he, he turns to Frodo at one point and goes, I ran out of weed like two weeks ago. I really need to smoke. But again, I feel like Peter Jackson, again, like even though he was based, of course, on the, the Lord of the Rings books, I feel like Peter Jackson had a real fondness for that character. And like that, and, and you can see in that film and how much he gives him and Ian McKellen bring more, so much in that role and help expand that role to more, well, to more of a supporting character in the books. So it feels like, again, it feels like a like again, like one of the leading, like many leading characters in that film, but I think his leading performance stands out most in that film. Well, sure, but Ian McKellen's a great performer. Like, again, a good actor can read a bad script, like, they could read the phone book and make it interesting. Like, Ian McKellen is one of those guys, and everybody in those movies was gung ho to make this movie. They all read the books, they were all huge fans of Tolkien way before they signed on. Like, Christopher Lee came in and was like, Make me Gandalf. And Peter Jackson had to be like, I got Ian McKellen. Sorry, man. <laughs> well, I also feel like, again, you, the, again, I feel like Dragonheart also, like, again, there's like, you say that it's feel like it's solely focused on Bowen. There's like, again, Diamaya is Kara. And again, it's like, it's, it feels like it's like trying to have her have a full arc. And again, yep. and then Pete Paul's wise, like, and again, it's like, it has so many things it wants to try to like connect or whatever. And I feel like it's runtime kind of does a disservice and all them ones, especially um, Sir Bones gets completely short shrift by the end of that film. Whereas I feel like the yeah, only person, Sean Carney's Draco is the only one that really has a full arc and you feel like actually feeling like the character. Whereas I feel like Bones is more of generic white knight uh, character. That, I mean, I don't think this Quaid, as much as a good actor he is in a certain type of role, I don't think he really adds anything as Sir Bowen. Oh, his intensity is one of my favorite things. Like he knows when to dial it up and when to be reserved. Like, and uh, granted, a good amount of the emotion from that movie comes from the way it's shot and the story itself. Yeah, it does have a lot of ideas. Like they straight up couldn't put 
everything they wanted to into the movie. But guess what? They had a novelization made earlier that year with all the ideas that they couldn't put into the movie because this uh, this idea was so real to them. Like they won't really wanted to tell this story. And Dragonheart, I think, is an underrated movie overall. Like nobody talks about it, and it's fantastic. Even with like the bad CG, it was still revolutionary from the time. And Bowen's a great character, no matter how you slice it. His relationships and the way he plays off of Brother Gilbert, Kara, Einan, and the Queen, like they create a very real feel to this guy. He's three dimensional. And time. All right. We're going to go into the one minute closing period. Shannon, you are back up first. Time starts when you begin speaking. Um, again, I, I will elaborate more on Alejandro's last point about the novelization, which is very apt considering that um, I feel like um, the Lord of Rings, uh, the film, again, it um, it can stand on its own um, without I any, mean, I mean, or you can connect it with the original books, but it was great about it, it stands on its own. Whereas Dragonheart, if you have to bring in the novelization to make up for the lack of the rushing of character arcs and stuff like that, it kind of tells you. That I mean, how like very like flawed that film is, and how like I mean, how like lacking the character of Sir Bowen in particular is. If you have to, I mean, add I mean, go more to like find more backstory for him. Um, um but I would like, say like watch the Fellowship Ring and tell me that you don't think Gandalf is one of the best characters in a film with many great actors. This way is fine. It's Bowen, but I can see several actors that could do the same performance and several could do it much better performance, but. Name me even if you play a live action game of um, in the Fellowship of Ring. And time. All right, Alejandro, you have the final minute on the clock when ready. The Lord of the Rings will always be an unmatched epic. A story so carefully crafted, you know what hobbits smell like. Dragonheart is an original story that builds a fantasy world arguably just as visceral, and it didn't need four encyclopedias to tell it. Uh, they did have the novelization that was drafted earlier that year, but for time restraints or whatevs, but Dragonheart is a powerhouse fantasy film. Bowen is not particularly special. He doesn't have magic powers. He's not trying to claim his destiny. He's literally just wanting to right a wrong that he feels responsible for. It's a big boy character arc, and there aren't enough of those in the world. Uh, hell, even the sequel to Dragonheart went back to the young aspiring hero story, and that's why it'll never hold a candle to the original. Gandalf is a great character in his own right, but when it comes to leads, you can't do better than so Sir Bowen. It's one of those movies I watch over and over again, and Bowen is a big reason as to why. All right, that is time. Uh, we'll go ahead and move to the judges, competitors, thank you once again, as I will go ahead and bring the judges in. Uh, in terms of quick uh, fact checks uh, that we can do, uh, so Dragonheart <clears throat> comes in uh, at an hour and 43 minutes, so the runtime given was roughly correct. Uh, there was a novel for Dragonheart, uh, depending on where you live, it either came out before or after the movie. In the U.S., the movie was released in late May. However, in the U.K. and Europe, it wasn't released until October of 1996. The novel was released worldwide in June of 1996. Now, the screenplay did come first, uh, and the uh, screenplay, uh, the author of the screenplay and the book has said that it is... Uh, the book is based off of the various drafts of the film in which details that were left behind as they moved from draft to draft were all included in this all-encompassing uh, book. But it did, depending on where you live, it may have come before the movie, but in terms of writing, it was written after the screenplay was produced. Uh, though Christopher Lee had always dreamed of playing the character of Gandalf, he never did actually attempt to go for the role in the movie. Uh, he had decided himself that he was too old to play the role, especially given the physicality of the character, the horse riding, the fighting, uh, which is why he was offered Saruman instead. However, Ian McKellen was actually the third choice for the role. Both Sean Connery and Patrick Stewart were outright offered the role ahead of time. Uh, Connery turned it down because, as he's famously said, he didn't understand the script, and so he chose not to take it. Uh, this, combined with The Matrix prior, is why he decided to take the next script that he didn't understand, and then his career ended. 
Uh, Patrick Stewart, I believe, turned it down because he was already the face of two franchises at that point. He was a lead in the X-Men films as well as still being a part of Star Trek franchise. Uh, so he turned it down for that reason. Um, and then in terms of the adaptation of Gandalf, as far as I could find, uh, most of the things that were changed from the book were plot related in the sense of the activity of his involvement in the plot. In terms of the character portrayal itself, how he was portrayed, the biggest change is that in the film, in order to appear more human-like, because in the book he isn't quite human, he sort of has this angelic background that was left out of the movie adaptations, McKellen chose to portray him with a bout of anxiety in order to make him come off as a little more relatable to the audience. Uh, with that said, though, Noah, I'm going to go to you. Who gets your vote based off the arguments and uh, what was the main selling point? Alejandro didn't attack Gandalf as much as I feel like he propped his movie up, which is fair. But the level which he propped up his argument was... I, in magnitude, just greater in what Shannon did with his. And I really believed him. Um, he, he, even though I haven't seen Dragonheart, um, I really felt his argument come across really clear. And um, I didn't hear as much like that from Shannon about Gandalf. So I'm, I'm going with Alejandro. Okay. Uh, Daniel, down to you. Same question. I, after many back and forths throughout the arguments, <laughs> I I did eventually fall on the side of Alejandro as well. I I think he argued for his character meticulously and made made the character a leading character in his arguments, whereas. Um, and even even taking the issues of novelizations out of both arguments, because it was in the film, uh, I I do think he argued for Bowen very meticulously and very well. All right. Well, judges, thank you guys so much. I'm going to go ahead and sit you guys in the back, because a final score of three to one is Alejandro Hernandez pulling out the victory. Congrats, Alejandro, uh, pulling out a victory. Obviously, you're coming in the back of this off the back of two losses following that debut win, so I'm sure the win feels good. How are you feeling? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, even in some of the exhibitions, I, I tend to sometimes do well and sometimes don't, but, man, this one was hard fought. Uh, Shannon's not a joke of a competitor, man. Like, that guy had me on my toes the whole time, and uh, I actually had to go back and watch uh, a few of his matches just to prep for like, uh, I took notes, like this is the hardest I've ever prepped for a match. So yeah, I actually would have been bummed if I hadn't walked out with the victory today. <laughs> Fair enough, I, I understand that completely. Uh, so yeah, so obviously you, you pull out the victory. It was a very tough fought match there. You guys were very, very back and forth. Uh, even if the voting sort of, especially a couple times, we only had two judges. When we were discussing behind the scenes, it was very clearly 50-50 amongst everyone's opinion. Um, do these types of wins feel better to you than the idea of like dominating a match and kind of running away with it? Well, I unfortunately wouldn't know. <laughs> I haven't had uh, a knockout okay. victory just yet. Actually, I think I did have a knockout in the Pixar exhibition, but we, we did. That was that was just for fun. So uh, doing a knockout victory is obviously on the list of stuff I want to get accomplished this season. But uh, I, I like victories like this where it is a struggle because that's where the entertainment comes in. You don't want to have just somebody get squashed, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, obviously now two and two, 50-50 record. Uh, it'll be a little bit before we have you back uh, just because the schedules, things line up that way. But what are you looking forward to potentially the next time that you come back? Uh, well, last time I was on, I, I got a chance to debate uh, Henry one-on-one. -on -one. I'd love to do that again. That'd be awesome to actually go three or four rounds with that guy. Like win or lose, I just think it's going to be super fun. Uh, but also I, I think I've stepped up my game a whole lot in the battleground, especially with this match. Like, I'm I'm going to be top of the tower. Absolutely. We'll give it some time. We'll see you when we get there. Till then, sir, wish you well, and we'll see you next time. As I'll go ahead and put you in the back and bring in your opponent. 
And just as how the hard-fought victories probably feel the best, the hardest-fought losses also feel not the best. Uh, Shannon, it was an admirable performance out there. Uh, some of those questions, I think you did a really great job, particularly the first one, which you won, and the last one, I think you had a really good argument there. So how are you feeling? Uh, I was going to say, I just, as always, I mean, it's uh, I knew it was uh, coming in, it was going to be the, another, like, the, the um, kind of tough battle. I mean, I know, like, yeah, like, Alejandro is kind of like me. Like, he, again, like, he, he is a very good competitor, and it just, like, kind of just depends on if, any given match, kind of like how, who, like, is able to sway the judges, judges at the, 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 the last second. And, and mm-hmm. like I said, it just kind of comes down who is just able, who, is, who has, who, we both have great arguments. It's just who able, who's able to have that one little edge to turn to, to turn the judges' uh, mind to in, in their favor, so. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so obviously, we'll have you back in the future. Of course, we look forward to having you. Is there anything you think you could sort of take from this match that may help you in the next one? Is there anything that may have happened or any sort of tactic you think may work? Just kind of going off what you saw here tonight. Hmm. I think, like I said, it's. I feel like it's more like trying to like um kind of i feel like maybe more of like trying to, to like kind of maybe dismantle my opponent's like argument a little bit more or as far as like or me more and probably more exact about like certain like um weaknesses or um negatives i can point to like their like certain like arguments and stuff i, I know on certain ones i was a little bit broad um, to be fair, the Lord of Rings, uh, Fellowship Ring, is a very long film, and it's kind of hard to rewatch a uh, three plus hour film on a very <laughs> uh, full time schedule. <laughs> to, so I kind of take the Cliff Notes version. So I feel like my like my Gandalf could have been my maybe my Gandalf argument could have probably been a little bit more specific, and that probably was to my detriment. But yeah. <laughs> It's hard to watch those movies when you have three and a half hours laid out in front of you. They're just so long. Uh, Even if you love them, it's hard, man. Uh, But no, it was great to have you back. Welcome back for 2023. We look forward to having you back next time. Hopefully it goes your way a bit more. But till then, take care of yourself, sir. We will see you. Thank you. Then, uh, guys, that is going to be it for tonight, though. Alejandro does come back to start the year off with a victory. Uh, and Shannon, at the very least, if not a win, he does have a good performance to hang his head on. Uh, and I look forward to seeing what both these guys do through the rest of the year. With all that said, though, thank you guys for watching. I want to thank my three judges, Noah, Chad, and Daniel, for being here tonight. I want to thank all of you for watching at home. Uh, please be sure to rate the video, drop a comment, subscribe to the channel, and stick around for more Movie Battleground because we always have more Movie Battleground coming at you. Uh, tune in, of course. We just uh, picked back up the scheduling after taking a week off. Uh, Tune in and watch the match that went up on Monday because it's the first three-person match of our new season. So you get to see something a little different. And then this upcoming Friday, we have the next exhibition of the season, which is going to be a Ryan Johnson exhibition, talking about director Ryan Johnson. So tune in and check out that to see some deep discussion on his films because there's certainly something to discuss within them, uh, even The Last Jedi. Uh, With that said, though, on behalf of our competitors tonight and everyone involved, my name is Aaron Canole. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. Take care, everybody.